All right, this is part four of Soil, the home for plants. Let's talk about fertilizer materials and some labeling. We won't get too, too technical about the materials. All right, what's on the label? You always have a guaranteed analysis. The total amount of nitrogen. Nitrogen can come in several forms. A nitrate nitrogen and ammonia, ammonia, ammonia like is just a way to remember it. And it may be water soluble organic and or urea nitrogen. Or it may be water insoluble nitrogen. Which do you think of those two would be fast to release? Water soluble or water insoluble nitrogen? That's correct. Water soluble organic and or urea nitrogen would be fairly quick to release. Water insoluble would be slow release. We'll be talking about quick release and slow release through the remainder of this module. Available phosphoric or phosphorus, soluble potash. Potash and potassium are synonyms for one another. So if I say potash, you know it's potassium. If I say potassium, you know it's potash. Chlorine, a not more than statement, is always on the bag. And chlorine, although one of the 17 essential elements for plants, it's like a lot of things, a little dabble do you. Chlorine in high percentage will cause a plant tissue to oxidize. A good example of this is if you get bleach on your plants, or for that matter, you drain the pool on the lawn and it turns brown a few days later, or within a few hours for that matter. And it's going to tell you where the various nutrients have been derived from, which may be very important, especially if you are looking for certain particular uh, materials. Now these may or may not be on there um, because the secondary plant nutrients are not always in the fertilizer itself. It would, but if they are, it would tell you how much mag magnesium, manganese, water soluble manganese, copper (Cu), sulfur, sulfur free combined. We won't go into the details. We'll just call it sulfur and where it came from. So here is a, a mock-up of a label, and you can see the total percentage of nitrogen is 8%. So that would correlate with the first big number on the front of the bag, 8. And it tells you that some of the nitrogen is in the nitrate form, some of it's more in the ammonia form, some of it's water-soluble, about 3%, and then there's about 
just a little under 3%, that's water insoluble. This also has phosphorus, it has 4% phosphorus. It also has 8% potassium, also known as what element? So the big three numbers on the front of this particular bag would be 8 dash 4 dash 8. So those big three numbers always are in the order of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. That's required by law to be in that particular order. And it'll tell you where those particular forms of those nutrients came from. Uh, you know, ammonium nitrate, urea, methylene urea polymer, that's a coated product, activated sludge, sewage sludge, that's a natural organic form of nitrogen, superphosphate, myriad of potash, sulfate of potash magnesia. You probably won't care to know, remember all those details. And this particular nutri the fertilizer has several other of the secondary plant nutrients, magnesium, in different forms of it, copper, iron, zinc, sulfur, etc. And it tells you where they came from. Oop, thought I had it here, but nitrogen is primarily responsible for leaf tissue growth and greening up of leaf tissue. Phosphorus is primarily for flowering. Potassium works on various different levels, but it also is primarily for uh, rooting. So let's look at this particular fertilizer for a moment. What would be the three big numbers on the front of the bag? Take a moment to look at this label. If it makes it easier, you might want to write it down with the dashes. So what is our total percentage of nitrogen? 15% is correct. What is our percentage of phosphorus? Zero. There's no phosphorus in this particular fertilizer. Then we have potassium. It's 15%. So the big three numbers on the front of the bag would be 15 dash 0 dash 15. Now some of you are probably going, gee, that doesn't sound like a good fertilizer to purchase. But if you remember earlier in the modules, I was talking about our soils typically have ample amount of phosphorus for plant growth, and in fact that we mine it out of our soils in central Florida. So generally speaking, we don't need to supplement with phosphorus. There are variations to this, but again, as a rule of thumb, we don't need to supplement with phosphorus in most of our soils here in central Florida. Too much phosphorus would become a pollutant in our water bodies and support unwanted plant growth like algae. And you can see I have little circles to show that if you weren't following along where I got the 15, 0, 15. So, does that make it a complete or incomplete fertilizer? You'll see a lot of our literature recommends a complete fertilizer for plant growth. That's a little bit misleading. Complete says to me it has all, all those 17 essential elements, right? It does not mean that. It means does it have the three main uh, primary macronutrients. In this case, this fertilizer lacks what nutrient? That's right, phosphorus. So it would be considered incomplete. That doesn't mean it's bad, it just it means it does not have all three primary, ma should say macro, there's a typo there, it should say macro nutrients. So this fertilizer is incomplete because it doesn't have that phosphorus. That doesn't mean it's bad.
So what does organic mean? You've heard us talk a little bit about organic so far in this class. Organic gets tossed about all too frequently and generally a lot of times improperly and people don't understand the difference. So organic, you would think there are some things that come to mind. Natural, non-man-made, some people say better. There are various other words that people might assign to the word organic. So look at let's look at this fertilizer, 666. It has 100% organic nitrogen in it. Now some of you may be very happy to find that in your local box store. You keep on reading, 20% of that organic nitrogen is natural and 80% is synthetic. Now how can something that is organic be synthetic? Let's go back to our chemistry, Dave's, and specifically organic chemistry. Organic chemistry is based on what particular element? Carbon is correct. So, this particular fertilizer, if we look down at the total nitrogen below the guaranteed analysis, has 6% nitrogen. We knew that when we saw the first six on the left-hand side in the big letters. I should say numbers. Then we have water insoluble organic nitrogen. 4.47 water insoluble nitrogen 1.53 well that doesn't really tell me which is the organic or which is the synthetic but if I keep on reading the derived from tankage that's a nice way of saying sewage sludge that is your natural organic nitrogen source isobutyldiene diurea I think that is correct but let's call it diurea and urea are man-made uh, forms of nitrogen. They are synthetic, but they contain carbon, hence it's organic. So for those people who are into organic gardening, you're going to have to find natural organic forms of nutrients such as nitrogen. They're available in things like manures. They're usually slow to release the nutrients to the plants, however. Other nitrogen sources that are natural organic, animal tankage, sludge, bone meal, biosolids, castor pumice, compost, not a lot of really a fertilizer, fish scrap tankage, you know, the fish emulsions and stuff. Uh, we won't go to garbage tankage, but again, it's there. Guano, back guano, manures, uh, seed meals, there's some other things out there. Uh, but don't let some of those uh, things fool you. Uh, guano, they don't just go in there quietly with a couple of shovels and a bag. They go in there with front-end loaders that make all sorts of noise and disturb the bats where they're taking it out of. Not sure if that's right or wrong, but that's just the truth. Nutrient ratios, this is where people can get hung up. A 1648 has the same ratio as 1236. 
but depending on the price, one of them may be of better value. But this will affect the application rate. As the numbers go up in the bag of fertilizer, the amount of fertilizer per area goes down. I'll explain more in a bit. So what makes a fertilizer balanced? We already talked about complete or incomplete. Now balanced, kind of sounds like vitamin commercials, doesn't it? The analysis for the primary nutrients is equal in value. What are the primary nutrients again? Nitrogen, phosphorus, potash, also known as potassium, correct. So. This is a balanced fertilizer. You might see that in reading some of our literature. Use a balanced fertilizer in your vegetable garden. That's where all three nutrients are of value. 666-888-10-10-10. All three fertilizers are basically similar. What's the difference? A 10-10-10 is about 40% more concentrated or stronger than a 666. So if you're heavy handed in the fertilizer, a 666 may be a better way to get more even spreading without burning versus a 101010 or a triple 20 or something on that order. Most fertilizer recommendations are based on pounds of nitrogen, the most needed element in plant tissue per 1,000 square feet of gardening area, whether it's a lawn, a landscape, or for that matter, a vegetable garden. So you're going to have to do some math to figure out how to calculate that. You divide the percentage of nitrogen into our constant, which is 100. So we have a 15015. I would take 15, the first one on the left, which is our percentage of nitrogen, and divide that into 100. That'll tell me how many pounds of a 15015 I'll need for 1,000 square feet of gardening area or landscape. So 15 divides into 100 how many times? Let's take a moment to pull out a calculator if need be. Maybe you're doing the math in your head. Let me give you another moment to think about this. So for those that are math-minded or have a calculator handy, 15 will divide into 100. There's our 15 I'm talking about. And that'll equal 6.6 .6 pounds of this particular fertilizer for 1,000 square feet of lawn, landscape, vegetable garden, or flower bed for that matter.
Water solubility of nutrients in a fertilizer de determines its usefulness. We've seen this slide before. Sometimes we want to get this into the plant quickly because it's very deficient. Other times we'd rather it be allocated over a period of time, especially during heavy rains, so it's not washed through or leached through the system. Most of our fertilizer recommendations will say use between 30 and 50 percent slow release nitrogen or fertilizers. You got to do some calculations to calculate the overall percentage of nitrogen that is in a slow release form on the, in the product. So let's look at this particular fertilizer. What would be the three big numbers on the bag? 15 for the total amount of nitrogen, 0 for phosphorus, 15% for potash. Okay, let's go back up to the total nitrogen. Underneath there, 7.5% is ammonia type, 7.5% is urea nitrogen. We see there's an asterisk. If we look down below, we'll see where the asterisk leaves us to. Oop, forgot those were there. So there's that asterisk that I was talking about. And then we read that 5% slowly available urea nitrogen from sulfur-coated urea. Remember I said a lot of these fertilizers have to be coated in some way to slow down the release of nitrogen? So this has 5% nitrogen coated. So if you want to think of that urea nitrogen, the other 2.5% has not been coated, but 5%. 5 so... 15 and 5, the answer is never on the bag, but let me try to use an analogy. You have an exam with 15 questions. That's the total number of questions, correct? I just told you it is. So you get five, per, 5 of them wrong. Sorry about that, but you got 5 of them wrong. What percentage of the questions did you get wrong? Some of you have figured that out to be one-third already. So don't sweat this. But again, yes, one-third of the fertilizer, or 33 percent, is slowly of slow release nitrogen. Our recommendations are for nitrogen or fertilizers to be 30 to 50 percent slow release. Does this one fit the definition? Yes, by three percent over. That's good. Now sometimes you'll see that it's higher than that depending on the product. Sometimes it doesn't exist in the product whatsoever. You have to read the labels. So there's the math you can see what I did and you can study this slide at your own pace. New fertilizer recommendations. This has been around for about a decade now. Uh, the nitrogen or the ratio of nitrogen to potassium, generally speaking, for our recommendations is a one-to-one -one ratio, with the phosphorus or that middle number to be zero or two. Here are two examples: 15015 or 15215. Now, some people may not be able to find that. Let's say I had 
uh, I had a product with the first number being 20. What would I want the next two numbers to be? Write down 20 if it helps you. So that middle number should be what? Or no more? That middle number should be less than or two or less. And then the last number should be equal to the first, another 20. You might find that. You might find 18, 0, 18. You might find 10, 2, 10. Well, it's the difference in application, though. Depends on how, percentage of nitrogen in there. The higher the number percentage of nitrogen, the less per thousand square feet you will apply. We'll talk more about the mounts uh, for some of the plants in, when we talk about lawns, but St. Augustine grass generally needs, I recommend for most homeowners, one in the spring after green up and one in the fall right after the last named wind event comes through the town. Bahia grass, one to three is probably more than enough. Uh, shrubs, zero to six. Zero? Well, why is that? Well, if they're well established and there's a lot of grass around them, they're probably getting a lot of the nutrients from the turf grass and don't need to be fertilized right around the mulch that's real close to the stems. Other cases, we may be growing some shrubs that need more fertility. Good example would be roses. For best flowering, they're going to need several light applications of fertilizer throughout the growing season. Fertilization at the wrong time of year. I can't tell you how many times I hear people putting out fertilizer in our winter time. Yes, I said winter, even though by comparison where I grew up, it's really quite mild. Again, you won't get any growth response. You can also make plants more susceptible to cold. If they're actively growing and have soft green tissue, they're more likely to freeze. Leaching, that's the downward motion of the nutrients in the solution or they run across the land in what is runoff or stormwater runoff. Remember this, our warm season turf grasses, that's what we grow here, uh, their growth is based on temperature, which in the summer is hot, obviously, and day length. That's why you notice about middle of September, although it can be fairly hot, you're starting to mow a little less often. Maybe not twice a week, but maybe once a week, or maybe, if you're lucky, every 10 days are less frequent than that. So it can be a waste of time, money, and fertilizer.
What is the correct time of year to fertilize the lawn and the landscape during the growing season? Although there are some particular counties surrounding us that have fertilizer blackouts during this key time when plants need nutrients. That's another story for another time. The growing season for us in central Florida is about mid-March. It can be a little later in some years when we're cold to about mid-October. So most of our lawn and landscape plants need, if we're going to fertilize, would be between about mid-March to mid-October. Now there are some, some things that buck that general rule of thumb. A good example is your vegetable gardens. They're productive from fall into the spring, early part of summer. So they would need fertilization during the winter. If you're growing flowering annuals, for example, during the winter months like pansies or snapdragons or something, they would need regular fertilization during the winter months as well, because they're actively growing during our cool season. Now, many of you do not live on right directly on a body of water, as you can see in this photograph, but if you have clientele that come in, or you do actually live on that or a stormwater pond, leave what we call a ring of responsibility. This is keeping the fertilizer from getting into the body of water. This is achieved in a couple of ways. If you have a spur that slings it out, the rotary style, a lot of them come with a deflector shield, and that can be put down to keep the fertilizer from coming out one half of the of the gizmo. Another way is just to keep your fertilizer spreader back by three feet if it's a drop spreader or about ten feet if it's a rotary style without a deflector shield. Now there are other ways that we may get fertilizer into our bodies of water that we don't think about. A lot of us will have storm drains somewhere in our neighborhood or subdivisions. Storm drains don't magically go somewhere to be processed and remove all the, all the residues. They usually lead down the street. Here's a placard down there. And you may see this in some communities that say, let only rain go down the storm drain. Because these are not somehow magically cleared up, as I've said. Uh, if you don't have storm drains, you may have curbing. That's carrying whatever nutrients that may have gotten into the pavement along right down to the nearest body of water, that low spot in your community, for example. Now, if you look at the picture at the lower left-hand side of the screen, you can actually see brown little dots on the concrete. What do you think caused those brown little dots on the concrete? At some point in time, fertilizer got spread over over the lawn and some of it got cast onto the concrete. The iron in the particular fertilizer oxidized and stained the concrete permanently a rusty brown. 
what could that landscaper have done to prevent that from going right into that storm drain? A uh, leaf blower could have blown that right back into the into the landscape onto the lawn would have been one way to fix it. When we fertilize, it's best to broadcast the fertilizer uniformly over the root system of our plants. One easy way to do it is to use a, a fertilizer spreader. Oh, here's that deflector shield, as I was talking about, that can be employed, and that keeps the fertilizer from going on one side of the fertilizer spread spray, however you want to say that. And that you could deploy as you're close to a body of water or impervious surface, like your driveway or walkways. Here's some more interesting research information. Research indicates that it is not necessary to inject fertilizer into the soil in most cases. Anyone remember those deep root feeders? Also, most established trees, three to five years after planting, do not benefit from supplemental fertilizations. Maybe some of the fruit-bearing trees might, but the rest of the ornamental ones usually do not. I did mention this, I think, in botany about our original perceptions of where tree roots are. The top picture is kind of what most textbooks through probably the 70s showed in their diagrams, that the roots went out to the edges of the branches and they went down as deep as the plant is tall, in this case a, a tree. The lower picture is far more accurate rendition of where tree roots are and our shrubs. They're usually two to three times the diameter of the top and the vast majority of tree roots and shrub roots are in the upper foot or so of soil. Here's a poor graduate student probably having to do some back-breaking work, but you can see a tree here in the middle of the photograph, and you can see he or she carefully dug and found just below the soil surface, just under the grass, uh, just under the grass are a whole bunch of roots spreading out at least twice the diameter of the top and then you can see they're only a few inches below the soil surface. So putting fertilizer right up along the trunk of that tree is going to do absolutely nothing to get the nutrients into that particular tree. So it's getting it mostly through the lawn. These were hot items when I was a kid, and I think most people bought into the idea, and I still see advertising for deep root feeding. Again, these probes go down two to three feet, and they inject liquid fertilizer almost exclusively way down deep, well past the root system, and by and large, you just wasted a whole bunch of money and time and got virtually nothing into the plant. I don't know whose idea it was to invent these, but they're still being sold today at a home improvement center by you. Walk right past it. Actually, run past it if you can. What about fertilizer spikes? Well, rather than that being a long probe, let's say that were a six-inch fertilizer spike. 
and I bang it into the ground at the drip line of the tree. Well, what percentage of the root system is getting contacted by that, you know, one inch diameter fertilizer spike? Yeah, some of you probably did the math in your head and said, well, that equals about zero. That's about right. Here's a shrub growing in the landscape, been in there for a few years, and the roots are spray painted white so you can see them in the photograph. But you can see how they've spread beyond the drip line of this particular shrub, and you can see that they're in that upper foot or so of soil. So what is really happening when we fertilize a plant? All right, let's look at this graph. Let's start at the lower, I always forget which is X and Y axis, where it says low and 0%. Let's start in that lower left-hand corner. So then we can see 0 and low. Then we see water and nutrients. We can say from left to right, the water and nutrients are low. They go all the way to the high side. Then we can see on the axis going up, 0 to 100%. Notice with relatively low water and low nutrients, the plant isn't doing a whole lot of much. It's not growing much, and it's not photosynthesizing much. It's probably about ready to bite the dust. We have some water, whether it's rainfall or irrigation, and we quickly, and we add maybe a few nutrients, or the soil that has nutrients already occurring, we can see very quickly that photosynthesis maxes out on the relatively low amount of water and nutrients. This is all relative depending on various plants, but you get the idea that it doesn't take a lot of water and nutrients to get photosynthesis for most plants to max out very quickly. At some point, these plants aren't growing very fast. Look at the darker blue, not the brighter blue, but their growth rate is fairly, fairly slow. Like I talked about plants in the woods, they don't grow feet a year, most of them. They grow inches or part of an inch, depending on the plant, in a year. So their photosynthesis may be maxed out, but their growth rate isn't. Now, as a gardener, that can be problematic. I want those plants to grow quicker because I want it to screen off from my neighbors. So I want my hedge to grow faster, or I want the roses to bloom more often, or I want better yield of my broccoli plants or my corn or whatever I'm growing. So I add more water and more nutrients. Notice what happens to the growth. It quickly maxes out or can max out pretty quickly. But notice where we have two lines starting to cross. This is probably where we want to be with most of our plants, is either is where their growth is good, but their defense mechanisms, the leliopathic chemicals, are also fairly strong. But if we start adding more water and nutrients, the growth rate may soar or continue to grow, but what happens about the plant's ability to defend itself with these alleliopathic chemicals? It goes down. So when a plant is sick, what do most people start doing? They start adding water and nutrients. What are they telling the plant to do? The plant can't photosynthesize any faster. It's already plateaued and maxed out way back when. Now we're forcing it to grow, okay, at the expense of defending itself. This is why when plants are sick or don't look so good, the last thing they usually do is fertilize them and add more water. This usually causes a plant to tank or die. So this is a really good example of what's going on when we push plants too far. We can either tell it to grow or we can tell it to defend. There's a happy medium somewhere in there, gardeners.
Here's some research from further north, um, and it's a little old, but again, uh, I think it's very interesting. The effects of soil fertility on growth and insect resistance in some plants further north. But I think we can glean from this or extrapolate out something very similar happens here in Florida. Here they did experiments on birch, willow, and crab apple, none of which are very common in this area. High fertility increased growth. You would have expected that, right, from that last graph, but had no effect on photosynthesis. You're not surprised based on that chart I just showed you. High fertility increased nitrogen levels in the foliage, as would you have expected, but decreased phytochemical concentrations and resistance to gypsy moths and ten caterpillars. Huh. And those are huge problems for um, plants further north. A lot of people say, I get all these bugs and the diseases on my plants. Usually it's because they're pushing them with too much fertilizer at the expense of the plant to defend itself against things to eat on it or to be disease-causing. Interesting thing is the larval survival rate of those gypsy moths and ten caterpillars was significantly higher on fertilized trees. Think about that. Why might that be? Hmm. Well, if I have more nitrogen, that's a building block of protein. And plants and animals need proteins in order to grow and reproduce. Wow, I've just made a buffet for the insects to be healthier. Pretty much is what you did. Other research. Fertilization favors sucking insects or piercing sucking insects, such as aphids and scales. We see that a lot on various plants in our landscapes. Fertilization does not increase tree resistance to wood borers or bark beetles. Drought stress reduces resistance to borers. Not surprising. Stress to plants usually reduces their resistance to things. Fertilization increases the water requirements of trees. More leaves, reduce root growth, and can increase drought stress. What do people like to do when we first start warming up in the spring to their turf grasses in about March or April? They usually start spreading a heavy amount of fertilizer on it. Usually this is a, some of the driest months of the year, April into May. Of course, that can vary from year to year. So now we've decreased drought tolerance of our turf grasses at a time when we want to increase it. So I usually tell people, wait till the rainy season returns. Plants don't drop over dead overnight for lack of fertilizer. They do drop over dead overnight when you over fertilize.
too much of a th good thing can be too much. Too much fertilizer can cause excess growth. And then we pay somebody to haul it away, cut it off and haul it away. Do we need that plant to keep on growing two feet a year from high fertility? It also increases pests, as I mentioned a moment ago. It wastes time, labor, and money. It also can contribute to non-point source pollution. And people put out fertilizer when the grass is growing really fast, and now they're mowing it with a heavier-duty machine to get it done. I haven't quite figured out when people will realize, gee, maybe I should wait till it's a little less rainy to put out fertilizer. We'll talk more about this in turf, but here's a test plot at the University of Florida a few years back. Notice how the over-fertilized turf grass, this is a St. Augustine grass, hard to say what cultivar, could be Floritem, maybe another one. Notice how the over-fertilized grass on the right-hand side of the test plot was attacked by chinch bugs. Notice the left-hand side was pretty much left, by and large, alone. Considering there's no barrier or chemical treatments that were employed, you can see that the pests simply quit feeding on the less fertilized turf. Why would that be? probably doesn't taste as well. Also, because the tissue isn't as soft and as succulent, it's harder for them to actually pierce their little mouth parts in there and suck out the fluids. Also, that turf on the left-hand side is less nutritious, so a lot of them probably just fail to develop as far along as the ones on the right-hand side. So what's the take-home message? A lot of people ask me, how do I prevent chinch bugs in my St. Augustine grass? Most people would be thinking I'm going to recommend some kind of chemical application. I'm going to recommend that you fertilize your grass properly. It's kind of like going to your doctor and him or her saying to you, exercise more, eat more fiber, quit smoking, lay off the booze, and on and on and on. Your doctor isn't trying to make your life miserable. He or she is trying to extend your life and make you healthy. You can overdose on nitrogen. It leads to carbohydrate depletion and stresses turf and other plants. The excess root to shoot growth can also be a problem. All of a sudden, the plant is putting out shoots in expense of roots. This lush growth can attract insects and diseases. But when a plant doesn't look too good, what do people start pulling out? Usually the fertilizer. This is going to make a disease far worse than if it were not fertilized and be more attractive to insects in the process. So, let's look back at some of the things as a review. We recommend, generally speaking, fertilizers that contain at least 30 to 50 percent slow release nitrogen, especially during the rainy season. This is something you should know as master gardeners how to calculate. Hint, hint. Use fertilizers which have 2% or less phosphorus, unless the soil test tells otherwise. Fertilize at the right time of the year. What is the right time of the year again? Primarily the growing season, mid-March to about mid-October. There are some exceptions, as I mentioned. Fertilize only when needed. What's the goal that you want from that plant? I want to mow it more often. Is that your goal? Then fertilize. If your goal is to make it darker green, then maybe fertilization would help. If you're wanting to keep it healthy, maybe a more moderate or reduced approach to fertilizer application is in order. This will end part four of soil, the home for the plants. Wow, I guess I really wanted to end twice, huh?